Wow, Ashley, we just sat down with Matt Dunphy, one of the leading experts in the world on CWD, and we got a lot more food for thought, a lot more things to think about as we're moving along on this podcast. And one of the things that stuck out to me really strongly was the idea of prions not being alive. I mean, I think we mm-hmm. knew this, but man, it really struck home about, you know, it's, it's this chain of amino acids and the difficulties that that would create for trying to eradicate it because you can't kill it. And I'm air right. quoting here. You can't kill it. It's <laughs> alive. So that makes it more difficult. And then we explore that a little. What stood out to you? One of the things that stood out to me was talking about the progression of the disease from where it was first found across the country and, and now across the world, unfortunately, and just how if you think you don't have it, if you think your state doesn't have it, you very likely are wrong. <laughs> um, and how much testing has played into us knowing or not realizing where the disease actually is. Yeah, I think this episode really set the stage. It 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 I think begs it'll beg questions for for listeners, it begged questions for us. It's really informed a lot of the ways we're we're thinking about this as we talk to additional guests. I think folks are going to are going to be pretty energized as far as wanting to know more after they listen to this. I think so too. Yeah. Matt is a great guest and just a wealth of knowledge and he shared that with us today. So it was great. So check it out, folks. Here we go. Episode number one with Matt Dumphy from the Wildlife Management Institute. Chronic wasting disease, an always fatal and definitely complex neurological disease afflicting cervids across North America and beyond. More than 50 years after its discovery, the impacts of this disease are ramping up quickly while hunters are having to make tough decisions about how they hunt and feed their families. What does this mean for the future of big game hunting? What can be done to stop the spread and conserve our hunting traditions. The Chronic Wasting Disease Chronicles explores these issues with leading experts from around the country and looks hopefully to a future full of healthy, wild cervid populations. Brought to you by NWF Outdoors and Artemis. Welcome to the Chronic Wasting Disease Chronicles. Welcome to the Chronic Wasting Disease Chronicles. This is Aaron Kendall. I'm here with my co-host, Ashley Chance. How's it going today, Ashley? It's going well. Happy to be here. Well, thanks for being here. And we're lucky today. We have a guest we've been really chasing after because we think he's going to give us all we need at the beginning to really start exploring this issue. And our guest today is Matt Dunphy. How's it going, Matt? It's going great, Aaron and Ashley. Thanks for having me. I'm glad the hard to get is finally over and we're all together here. Well, we're glad too, and uh, we're glad we're we're talking about this and exploring it, even though it's a little bit of a you know depressing subject in a lot of ways. But uh, let me tell you about Matt, and then we're going to get into this. Uh, Matt's the director of special programs for the Wildlife Management Institute, and one of the main projects he manages is the CWD Alliance, which the National Wildlife Federation is part of, and he works on a lot of different things for that crew. And he has been working on CWD-related issues since about 2006. And he has a background in wildlife disease ecology and management, outdoor recreation and R3 work. Our listeners will know what that is, recreation, recruitment, and reactivation. Or uh, Sorry, recreation, recruitment, retention, and reactivation. And uh, he also works on fish and wildlife management, hunter education. And mainly the reason we wanted to have him on here is he's widely considered one of the leading experts in the country on CWD. So thanks for coming, Matt. And uh, we really appreciate your time. Hey, thanks for having me. It's, as you said, it's not always fun to talk about an always fatal neurological disease of cervids, but we'll do our best to make it fun and interesting. Let's start from the top. This is a podcast series about chronic wasting disease. Uh, Can you just kind of lay out for us, what is CWD? Sure. I'll, I'll do the uh, sort of off the top, quick and dirty, and then where I miss stuff, Ashley, will depend on you to ask some further questions. So um, chronic wasting disease, 
we call it CWD, is a always fatal, what we call a prion disease. And it's, it's, it's a type of disease that a lot of mammals have. There's a version of these prion diseases that affect humans. There's a version that, that affects sheep. There's versions that affect cattle. Now, the, what we're talking about today, CWD, is the version that affects deer and elk. Or deer and, elk. and the bottom line is that this disease is caused by a thing we call a prion protein. And that is a protein that has the potential to rearrange itself. And when it rearranges itself, it becomes infectious and damaging to the host. So there's an important nuance here. We're not talking about a disease in the way that most of us think about disease. And that is that it's infectious, that there's a living agent that causes the disease or like the one we all think about a lot these days, COVID-19, that it's a, a virus. CWD and its its agent, these misfolded proteins, are non-living, so it's not alive, which is kind of a weird thing to get our heads wrapped around. Again, it's very simply, it is a protein that floats around in mammal bodies. It usually has something to do with, or we think it has something to do with cellular communication. It might have something to do with neuron um, uh, uh, managing we're really not quite sure. Honestly, we're not as sure as we would like to be, but all mammals have these. Uh, they float around doing their job. Usually the body, after they do their job, the body breaks them down and then our cells make more of them. Well, what CWD is at its, as, at its heart is a problem with that particular protein. It changes its outside shape. All proteins have a particular folding pattern that makes them do what the body wants them to do. Well, when that folding pattern changes, something else happens. That protein it no longer breaks down in the body. So it becomes what's called insoluble. And when more proteins like it find each other, they aggregate together, forming these clumps. We call them um, amyloid fibrils. And they just live in the animal. And then as more and more of these build up, they start to affect the animal's physiology. They really affect the um, the neural the, the neural system. Uh, that's why often when CWD uh, samples are collected, they're sampled from the brain um, or the brain stem. And so over time, what happens is when one of these proteins that is misfolded hits one another protein that is not misfolded, it causes that normal folded protein to misfold like the infectious one. Now here's the funny thing: we actually don't know how this happens. So the way I like to have folks think about this is if you hold out your hand with your fing fingers extended, that's the way these normal proteins work and look in your body. Now go ahead and close your hand into a fist. All your fingers are there. Your palm is still there, but it's in a very different conformation. And what happens inside the body is one of these closed fist proteins hits against one of these palm open proteins. It causes that prom palm open protein to close. That's how this thing replicates. And then again, they kind of clump together and they form these fibrils that don't break down in the body the way the healthy protein is supposed to. And that clumping and building up in the body, ultimately, after a lot of time, um, results in what we see, what we call a clinical stage of chronic wasting disease. That's where the animal starts to lose weight. It's listless. It often walks around in repetitive patterns. You see it around water sources. Its head will hang down. And then at that stage, that stage can last anywhere from days to honestly months. Um, the animal will eventually die. It's always fatal. So there's a, there's a lot of science in there. Try to not go too deeply. But on uh, the, the the bottom line is we're dealing with a disease that is caused by a non-living agent. It takes a long time to incubate in the animal, months and months, and it sheds infectious agents into the environment through saliva, feces, urine that can be uptaken by other animals. And when those other animals, susceptible animals, uptake some of those misfolded proteins, that causes that cycle in the uninfected animal and they'll eventually succumb to it. Oof, that was a great synopsis. Um I want to I want to touch back on a few things just to make sure that we've got clarity around this. So they're always fatal, um, which means every animal. And, and I guess too, I want to go back to you. You mentioned deer and elk. This is a disease that affects all North American cervid. So that would include moose, all species of deer as we know them, mule deer, whitetail, um, elk, and caribou. Correct. That is correct. 
Yeah. And, and I think it's good that you bring out the the always fatal aspect of this disease. And again, the best way to remember this, I think, is that, again, it is the disease is caused by a non-living agent. That's a good way to remember why this thing is always fatal. It's a non-living agent, meaning that our immune system or an animal's immune system doesn't really address it. You can't, quote unquote, kill it. I know we oftentimes, as scientists, misuse words when we're trying to be non-eggheadish to the rest of the public, and and we probably shouldn't do that. We should just say the way it is, but we'll say like, the, we, you know, we killed the disease or the disease um, uh, infected an individual. Both of those terms are actually not accurate because we're just talking about proteins. It's 240 or so amino acids linked together that cause this disease when they misfold weirdly. So because of that, that's why it's always fatal is we can't quote unquote, kill the thing in an animal and to specifically attack a protein and just one protein is incredibly difficult. And thus far, we don't have the technology to do that. So once this chain reaction of misfolding proteins happens in a susceptible animal, it will ultimately result in death every single time. Yeah. uh, Imagine a set of dominoes as you're describing the process of a, a misfolded prion causing others to misfold. I think that's fair. Yeah. Can we go back to, you mentioned the incubation of the disease. Um, For folks out there who aren't super familiar with disease terminology, what does the incubation period represent? So when we talk about incubation period, the simplest way to say it is we're simply talking about the period it takes from an animal to become quote unquote infected. In this case, we might say contaminated by the misfolded prions to the date at which we see external signs and the animal becomes clinical. And and that's when, uh, in the case of CWD, as I mentioned before, the symptoms of listlessness and head drooping and emaciation, those type things start to happen. And that that incubation period is another really important aspect to understand about this disease because it's so long. Again, it's hard for most of us to get our heads wrapped around when we think about disease because we think about infections rates in terms of days or sometimes hours. But in this case, we're talking sometimes years. I mean, incubation period in some deer go from 15 months to two years, which means there's an infectious animal on the landscape that doesn't really look sick, looks in fine condition, shows no external signs, but is actually shedding these infectious like misfolded prions into the environment and to other animals it comes in contact with. Yeah, I think that's that's a really salient point. And like you said, important to understand that once an animal is exposed, so to speak, once they've come into contact with CWD prions, they are then shedding them in the environment way before they look sick to anybody. Exactly. I saw recently a thing going around Facebook, um, It was a project, I think, out of Wisconsin where people were posting their photos of deer that they had harvested, oftentimes really nice, mature bucks that look spectacular, and then stamping it CWD positive. Um, Because just to raise awareness to the fact that if you see a deer that looks perfectly healthy, there's, there's no visual way to discern whether an animal is CWD positive or not. Th- that is such cases. a great, yeah, that's such a great point, Ashley. You're hitting on all the, <laughs> the the things that make this disease and or disease a nightmare to manage. And what you just said there is really important. And, and there's a there's a couple pieces of nuance. Let me add to that. Number one is when it comes to the hunter, it is true in wild animals that are infected with CWD. It is extremely rare that a hunter would ever be able to look at one and go, you know what, that looks a little bit off. I think I'm going to avoid shooting it. The main reason is because before any visual signs, the animal's behavior will start to subtly change. And that's likely due to the brain changes that happen. One thing I didn't mention at the beginning is that the the CWD is part of these, um, a family disease is called spongiform encephalopathies. The sponge in the spongiform refers to what we see in the brain when we look at the brain of an infected animal under a microscope, and there's these little holes all through it caused by those fibril clumps we talked about. So what that means on the landscape is that uh, an animal in this very highly competitive, um, selective environment will start to struggle a little bit neurologically well before you, people like you and I can see the difference. That means vehicles, predation, 
b- becoming infected with uh, another disease will often remove those animals, kill them far before the disease actually will. So let's keep that in mind. The other thing that you really want to keep in mind is that there are other diseases. Let's take um, EHD, for instance, a big one, a big disease that impacts a lot of white-tailed deer every year. And the animals infected with EHD look nearly exactly or let's say they show the exact clinical features of CWD. So it's really frustrating from a management perspective because we can't just go out there and look at deer through helicopters, or I've even (laughs) had people suggest drones and quote unquote, look for susceptible animals and target remove them because you're likely will never see them. And there's other things out there affecting cervids that whose symptoms look exactly like CWD. Yeah, there's so there's actually research out there demonstrating that uh, deer that are CWD positive die at a higher rate from a whole host of causes seemingly unrelated to CWD than uninfected animals. And should I is it okay for me to use the term infected uninfected? Well, yeah. Uh, again, or let's, should let's we go not... with? Should we get into the positive not detected? <laughs> discussion. <laughs> you know, I there was a time when I was younger where I would have said, let's absolutely be accurate. I, let's do what's easiest. And frankly, it's just easier to talk about infected versus uninfected. As long as that doesn't weed into policy formation, it's kind of the vernacular. So I'm fine let, with using infected and uninfected. Let's just use that. So there's actually research out there demonstrating that Deer infected with CWD die at a higher rate than uninfected animals from all causes, I think. Correct. Yeah. C- uh, CWD, um, well, from the things we've already talked about, uh, the, the mortality from, let's say, secondary causes, because the animal's health is starting to degrade a little bit, that leads to higher mortality. And then ultimately, if the animal is in, let's say, a more protected environment, for instance, we often see in suburban areas where you have the backyard deer um, or neighborhood deer, sometimes those animals can escape the those secondary mortality causes and will ultimately um, die from the disease itself. So when we talk about CWD prions, the prion proteins, we know they're not alive, so we can't kill them. Um, but what does it take to denature, to destroy a CWD prion? Great question. And th- therein lies another real problem with CWD. To completely denature, <clears throat> pardon me, a protein that has, that through its folding conformation has already become more robust to breaking down. Remember, that's one of the things we talked about initially that why the body can't take care of this is because as it folds, it becomes insoluble and the body just can't break it down the way it normal does, normally does. Well, that means it becomes extremely resistant to a bunch of other things like extremely ex- resistant to heat, extremely resistant to chemicals. So, um, w- when it comes to like actually breaking it down, we need temperatures extremely, extremely high temperatures higher than let's say like even a forest fire. There's a machine called an autoclave machine that is used in laboratories that sterilizes everything and cranks things up to thousands of degrees. It takes that kind of heat to denature them. So what that means practically is you can't cook it out of infected tissue. Um, cleaning tools becomes pretty tricky. These prions are small, so they get into the surfaces of things, things like knife handles or things like boots or tires. Um, And the chemicals required to denature, and I'm glad you use that term. Denature is the, again, egg-heady term we use to break a protein apart into its amino acids, essentially rendering it non-functional. So uh, the chemicals (laughs) required to do that... Um, are pretty stout and awfully ver- often very corrosive, like um, a bleach solution. A 50-50 bleach solution is enough to take the prions off of very smooth, polished surfaces, but it's a not enough to, to denature the prions if there's anywhere they can hide. So if there's flecks of dirt or tissue or um, if it's a, text- a substance like wood, that chemical solution isn't strong enough to penetrate and denature them. So we need very caustic, very environmentally unfriendly chemicals to, if we're going to go the chemical route to denature the proteins. And recently I found a paper, I think it was published in 2019. We can link to it in the show notes um, that talks about 
how CWD prions can be denatured in the digestive tract of mountain lions. Yeah, that's a really interesting um, avenue of study, largely because we, we've looked at other, well, let's, let's consider predators, for example. If, if we, if, well, let me back up even. Let's layer on some more nightmarish qualities of this disease from a management perspective with what we've already learned. So you've got this non-living disease agent that persists in the environment, that is infectious in the environment, that is really robust against all natural ways a protein might be broken down, heat-wise and chemical-wise. And it's living in really tasty critters um, when you look at the food chain. So you think about things like coyotes, um, mountain lions, bears, or sca other scavenger species like crows and ravens. A big concern ha for a long time has been a, does CWD infect these individuals? So if a mountain lion eats a positive CWD deer, does that mountain lion become infected with some sort of a prion disease? Or when that mountain lion digests that tissue from that infected animal and then defecates on the landscape, do, do the proteins survive within the feces to contaminate the ground and potentially be spread to new areas? So I would say we're far from, as, as a scientific community, we're far from knowing the right answer to those questions. But fortunately, as you noted, some research is coming out that indicates the digestive system of some of these um, species that we're talking about the prey on deer and elk, that, that might take care of some of the prions. However, we, all, we already do know, however, that prions can survive the digestive system of certain scavengers and other species. So I think at best what we're looking at right now is it, it can reduce the load of prions in the environment or infectious prions in the environment, but it doesn't look like it's going to completely sterilize them. Well, I feel like that in and of itself could be a win based on how long these prions currently persist in the environment, we know that they can actually bind to soil particles. Yeah. And so we can get into transmission here in a little bit and how that works. But basically, a deer can get the prions from another animal or even just from a place on the landscape and another animal has been, correct? Yeah. And this, we should really think about in terms of trying to manage this disease and free-ranging cervids on the landscape. So CWD is sort of unique amid that family of prion diseases. Remember, we talked about that family, including Critzfield jakobs disease in humans, mad cow disease in cows, obviously, and scrapie in sheep, as well as a couple others. Most of the prion diseases can only be passed on well, let me let me let me say this a little bit different. These prion diseases can happen in an individual through a couple different routes. Sometimes it happens spontaneously, which um, we've documented with uh, Critzfield Jakobs disease in humans, and even some of these other some of the other prion diseases. They happen in old age, and oftentimes their individual disease is not infectious to others. Um, the other way it typically happens is that a uninfected um, individual has to consume tissue from an infected individual. This is why the the mad cow disease scare of uh, like a decade ago and and um, w was so big because we found that by humans eating the contaminated meat of of, of uh, a mad cow infected a beef could potentially transmit the disease. Well, CWD is unique and it shares this characteristic with scrapie in that not only can a susceptible individual get the disease by eating the tissue of an infected one, but that environmental contamination, the prions being shed in the environment can also cause infection. And CWD and scrapie are really the only two that can do that efficiently, which is why unfortunately for us, it makes it so much worse because as you noted, there are a lot of conditions in nature that then can become reservoirs of this disease. The, the, the research you talked about uh, going to soil particles is that the, uh, these prions, when they attach to certain soil particles, particularly clay particles in soil types, they remain infectious for years. And we're talking maybe more than five years. And because of the way the proteins attach themselves to the soil, they can be even more bioavailable to an uninfected animal, which results in almost like more infectivity. 
So think about that. And then also think about how these things are shed. And I mentioned before saliva, feces, urine. Um, a hunter could think about things like salt blocks, watering holes, um, deer yards, um, feeding sites. We, recent research has showed, like with mineral licks, the contamination from deer saliva from their feces in a, in this in a one very congregated spot creates this very infectious zone that is now drawing in a bunch of animals that are going to be exposed to these prions that are infectious and remaining infectious all around the soil, vegetation, and water of that site. So again, this is when it comes to management, and we'll probably talk about management a little bit later, but it's good to start layering in some of these concepts. Management of this disease is incredibly difficult because how do you take care of all of these sites that may be spreading or let's say hosting these infectious prions, allowing animals to come collect them and then respread it to other uninfected individuals. It really creates kind of a nightmare scenario. Uh, this is fascinating stuff. And I, I want to jump in a little bit though, to get us back a little to the origins, because I think as a as people thinking about that, they're like, okay, this weird thing that's not alive where did this come from? Is it, you know, is it of this earth, <laughs> which obviously it is, but <laughs> let's go back a bit and talk about the origin of it. Where did it begin? How did it start spreading? You know, is it endemic in, you know, you mentioned these things being endemic in a lot of different critters. Is it endemic in cervids and something triggered it? Can you walk us through that a little bit? Yeah. I, and one thing I'm not going to do is refer to it as an alien disease or a zombie deer disease. I, uh, <laughs> I've been down, down that road already and, and there's <laughs> no you. good. We, we won't either. I, I, was, get, okay. I was getting close, wasn't I? I I'm not going to do it either. <laughs> I, I was starting to pucker, man. You're making Obviously, me it's of this earth <laughs> if it binds to clay particles so happily. Yeah, exactly. But it is a, it is a fascinating question, and honestly, it's I think there's something very human in wanting to know where something started. Uh, we we can look at the recent even COVID nineteen pandemic and and how uh, how you can easily just get wrapped up in where did this thing begin and what does that mean for us? Well, CWD has always had that, and we as a scientific community have always wondered as well. Um, to some degree, I guess I'll frame this conversation by saying, I'm not sure that it matters now um, because we have researched everything about this disease that that we can. We, we have more to learn, but we've learned a lot about it. I'm not sure how much we could be illuminated by understanding exactly where it came from, but it is interesting to consider. And here's the short answer. We don't know which is so unsatisfying <laughs> for me, as I'm sure for everybody listening to this and you two, we just don't know. Um, so let's try to piece together some things that we do know about this. First is um, modeling of the disease based on how fast it has moved and how we've watched it's moving um, lets us know that we that CWD, at least in the West, um, which is where w was kind of ground zero for CWD in North America, which is where we found it. Actually, my home state of Colorado and uh, its bordering state of Wyoming is really the ground zero. We know that it's been in wild populations for more than 60 years. Okay, so we can go kind of backwards in time and, and try to put some things together. Um, in the late 60s, 1967 specifically, um, it, it was diagnosed as some some weird disease that caused deer in the in the deer pens um, where it was first noticed at Foothills Research Campus in Colorado in outside of Fort Collins. Um, it, it was some sort of a disease that caused animals to quote unquote waste away. And so it was diagnosed as its own thing. But we didn't know what kind of a thing it was until more than 10 years later. In the late 70s, we actually found, oh, this is one of the prion type diseases. You know, and 10 years had gone by. Why we're, we weren't really sure was just a, this a thing that was common to um, uh, wild animals in pens or was it something else? So we diagnosed it then. Um, so now we can go backwards a little bit and go, okay, well, how did the animals in the pens get it? And the re the record starts to get really patchy, looking at where animals were taken from the pens, looking at the fences around the pens and notice, noticing that there's a lot of nose to nose interactions between deer outside the pens and deer inside the pens. So we start to go backwards in time a little bit. And there's sort of two theories of why it showed up here. 
One is the spontaneous theory. Um, as I said before, we have documented in many individuals, there was actually a moose in Norway a couple of years ago that just in its old age developed a spongiform encephalopathy and all the classic signs were there, the fibril amyloids, the holes in the brain, but it didn't look like it was infectious. So potentially this thing just happened in an old deer and it happened to be infectious, unlike some of the other spontaneous um, cases. And it went from there. So that's theory number one. It just sort of happened probably in the early part of the 1900s. The other theory, just because where we found it first, which is here on the front range of Colorado near Fort Collins, is that it's proximity to the Colorado sheep trail. So this area, uh, there was a lot of sheep migration from alpine pastures in the summertime to plains pastures in the wintertime. And given that CWD CWD and scrapie are two of the prion diseases that share this um, aspect of being infectious in the environment, being able to be shed into the environment and reinfect animals. There is a theory that maybe it arose from a mutation when a wild deer came in contact with the environmental contamination by some scrapie and sheep. Now, I'm really reaching here and we're really reaching here as a scientific community because we don't have any evidence of that. We don't have any evidence of scrapey rates during those times. We don't know how infectious things were, but it is just there's there seems like maybe a bit of a loose correlation between sheep and deer and CWD and scrapey because of that aspect of environmental shedding. But at the end of the day, what does it mean? It means that it started somewhere probably around here. We're not really sure how. And I think we can answer the other question, Ashley, that you posed, which is, has it always been endemic? Um, this is one I hear a lot from media folks, from celebrities, and from a lot of hunters is that, why should we worry about this? It's probably been there forever, ever. Well, here's my evidence for why I don't think that is the case. And, and that is, going back to the early 2000s, our nation really started pumping a lot of money into surveillance. We realized that CWD was in more places than just the West. Wherever we were looking for it, that's not true, not wherever. In many places we were looking for it, we were finding it. And we started to put a lot of time and effort into monitoring. Over the past 30 years, we have seen CWD continue to spread and increase in number. And Many of the places that we were first checking for it that we didn't find it now have it, meaning that it has moved into those areas somewhere in the last 50 years. If it was always here, when we first looked for it nationally, we would have found it in a lot of places spontaneously. And in the Rocky Mountain West, we'd have found it everywhere. And the fact is, we didn't, and we have been documenting its spread over the past 30 years very consistently to the point where we can take a retrospect retrospective look backwards and say, okay, this thing started in this area and then spread forward. So I think it hasn't been endemic ever. It's probably endemic now, um, given because of things we've talked about. But where it started, who knows? But again, I'm not sure that's going to tell us much more on how to deal with this thing now. Matt, as you're talking about the spread, if folks out there would like kind of a visual of the spread across the nation, um, the USGS has some really great maps that you can click through and chronologically they'll show you, you know, where it was found in wild populations, where it was found in free ranging populations over the course of like at least since 2000, I think maybe even they go um, earlier than that. Exactly. And and I'll just say in, in the next um, month or so, there's going to be an even uh, more useful tool uh, because of a project that myself and several other organizations have been working on for about a year. And that is an ArcGIS type mapping application where individuals can look and see where CWD is. Um, so there's some good tools where people can get a glimpse of what has happened. And as you mentioned, the USGS site is a great one for this. There's one caution I do want to put in here, though. And this, this may be unimportant to most folks, but for us scientists, it's a really important thing. Those maps that over time show CWD increasing to new areas, very broadly and coarsely speaking, they're correct. It has moved to new states. It has increased in its prevalence within the places it's already been found. Um, that is true. However, 
one thing people should know is that since the early 2000s, there has not been a consistent sampling effort by all states and all areas of all states over time. Basically, what that means is we have very spotty surveillance sampling. I'll give you Colorado for an example. Um, Back in the early 2000s, there was a lot of work done throughout the state to try to document where it was. And then because it was pretty much endemic everywhere, we stopped looking in several places for many, many years. We recently started again, but that means all what was happening in those years isn't accurately portrayed in the data. We have other states like Wyoming that just really hasn't kept track of it much at all. We have other states um, in the Midwest that for much for the last 10 or 15 years, they were only doing what was called passive surveillance, meaning that whenever they found a dead deer on the road or a hunter just happened to drop off a carcass, they'd go ahead and test it, but they weren't doing it in a structured way. So it's probably you know too much nuance here, but I guess I just want to enforce the listeners Look at the look at that data carefully, and um, don't just assume that that spread is happening at the rate you're looking at. In many of the cases where CWD was quote unquote found in a given year, that was just the first year they looked for it, or let's say that's the first year they looked for it in a scientifically meaningful way. The disease was probably already there. I would, I'm confident enough to say the disease is already in many other areas that we haven't documented, and we're currently living with it. Um, and to me, that's one of the reasons why, as a nation, we should throw our backs into doing more testing and sampling to really understand where this thing is and how fast it's actually moving so that we can take better and more precise management actions against it. I think that's a very important point for our listeners to understand. And another thing that kind of goes along with goes along with what you were saying, Matt, is a lot of times I know uh, states have discovered or found CWD within their borders and very quickly afterwards learned that it was actually a much higher prevalence than they anticipated. So it wasn't like they found one positive and then couldn't find another deer with the disease for years. It was like, you know, in some cases they found one positive and then actually turns out the state next door that didn't think they had it at all is where they got it from. Yeah. And, and I think a good example of that is Tennessee most recently, unfortunately for them, they found it in sort of the Southwestern part of their state and they found it for the first time. And then as they kicked it, as that first discovery kicked in their CWD management plan and essentially ignited a bunch of sampling, they started finding it in way higher numbers and way higher densities than they ever would have thought. So it's kind of a, um, an unspoken rule among CWD managers is that the first time you find it is not the first time it was ever there. And there's only been that I can think of, I may be wrong here, but I think there's only ever been two cases where we found the disease and then never found it again. Um, one was in the Toronto Zoo where there were some mule deer, I want to say it was back in the 60s again, um, that th- were found to have CWD um, after they were transported to another area. And no, no CWD has ever been found again in the zoo or in the wild populations of deer around that. And then New York. New York is honestly the weird outlier here where three animals were found positive and the state did a heavy um, push to do a lot of surveillance around where the animals were positive and they never found another one. And so it's, it's kind of every, every year, everybody looks at the data from New York to see, is this a year we find more or did you guys really get away with it? So far, they're the only state that got away with it by detecting it early. So there's some management lesson there. Um, the, the, if, if you're going to manage this disease the best, it's surveillance, 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 constantly test, test all your borders, particularly if you border a CWD positive state and try to catch it early because there's some remote chance if you catch it early enough and you um, reduce the population enough where you found the, the one or few positives, you might be able to control it. But unfortunately, of the 26 states that now have it, New York is the only one that seems to have dodged that bullet. Matt, I want to get to a little bit more about testing, you know, what the latest is on that and since we're there, let's do it. And then let's circle too to, to prevalence and population level impacts and how much this is actually affecting the herds um, after mm-hmm. we get there. But but what's the latest on testing as far as, you know, what do you think the percentage of deer are, that are being tested, that are being harvested by hunters, for instance, 
where are the gaps as far as how much more testing we need. You know, the only thing we are aware of now is a is a post-mortem test. There's, I, I've heard different things about development of a, of a live test. Can you just kind of give us a rundown of that? Yeah. Well, and, and that could be a whole other podcast. So just let me hit on what I think are, in my arrogant opinion, are, are probably the more important things to remember. Number one is what we're trying to detect. So here's, here's the crux of all testing. We are trying to pick up a protein. Again, we're talking 240-ish amino acids. Super, super, super small. And in early stages of the disease, there's so few of them that they're really difficult to detect. So that's thing number one. What the testing is trying to pick up in most cases is these, these clumps of these misfolded proteins, or we can use, you know, slides of the brain sample where uh, of a brain sample where we can look for these holes, but that's way forward in the disease. So let's keep that in mind. So what does that mean? Well, it means a couple things. It means that testing is always going to be difficult and we're always going to be limited somewhat by um, how early we can te- detect the disease. So for instance, the gold standard of of testing right now where we, we use certain lab techniques to pick up these prion protein aggregates. Um, they're still not 100% effective, meaning you'll never get a false negative. Excuse me, you'll, you'll never get a false positive, meaning if it can pick it up and it says, oh, it's there, it's actually there. But you can get a false negative, meaning sometimes the test will say it didn't pick anything up, but there actually was infectious prions there. So actually, you look, we, we need to really look at these tests as recognition of detected versus not detected, as opposed to positive versus negative. So the best science we have still can't detect these misfolded prions in really low levels. That also means that if we use a sample like blood, for instance, this is a really important question because I think sportsmen, specifically sportsmen and women, get sold down the river by promises of a rapid blood test. What that means is the blood we already know, even in an infected animal, holds very, very few of these misfolded prion proteins because they like to aggregate in the neural system um, or the uh, lymphatic system. They're not in the blood much. So you're already dealing with a substance that has really small amounts of the infectious agent. And then you're going to say you're going to take a a drop or two of blood and drop it on, I don't know, a slide or something like it's a COVID (laughs) test and you're going to pick these up. That's that's unfortunately, that's just not not how the science works. And frankly, the billions of dollars that have been invested in the in agriculture um, disease uh, mitigation as well as human research, they in all that the, the money that's been spent by those fields have still not been able to come up with a rapid blood test. So let's just there's we should tailor our expectations when it comes to sampling. Now, the other part of this is unfortunately what that means if you're a hunter is that um, submitting and getting results from your, let's say, a head you submit or an animal you submit for sampling isn't a super quick process. It means someone has to collect a sample, means a sample has to be in pretty good quality. And then someone in in a laboratory has to actually conduct that test, wait for the results, then get it back to you. So I think we can do a better job at sampling lag time. But again, because the nature of what we're trying to detect here with this disease, we have to manage our expectations on how much are we actually going to do. So it, that that leads to, let me say, the, the last point I'd want to get to is because of all those things, we should really ask ourselves, what do we need testing for? And in my mind, there's a couple things. Number one is if you're an area, a state agency that manages wildlife in your state, for instance, um, and you don't have CWD yet detected, you should spend a lot of time sampling animals to detect it as early as you can so that you can instigate management actions. That's different from a state, for instance, like I'll use my home state of Colorado, who's had the disease since before the 60s. It's in a lot of different places. Um, and you know that you're not going to remove it all. Your goal should be different. It's not, um, we want to find where it pops up for the first time so we can jump on it. It's more of, we want to use testing to understand if our management actions are controlling the disease to the point where 
a herd can live with it and hunters can live with it. And so we should take a more nuanced approach there, but we should really focus it on management. And then the third arm is really, well, what about the hunter themselves who is going to consume these animals? And even though CWD has not been found to um, infect humans or humans to be susceptible to it, unless we actually took 20 people and injected their brains with the infected brains of deer, we're never going to know that answer for sure. So it's a really spongy answer to say, we don't know for sure if humans are going to get it, but it really doesn't look like they will. Well, that amount of uncertainty means we need to have some good testing protocols so that hunters feel comfortable that the testing results they get back are, you know, yes or no strong enough that they can decide to consume that animal or not. And we should do that in a, in a timely manner. And, and in my mind, put more resources there because we really need hunters. Where I'll end this testing monologue here and then kick it back to you, Aaron, is that of all the potential management tools that state fish and wildlife agencies have to manage CWD, the hunter is probably the most crucial because the hunter can be used in the pursuit of their activity to target certain animals that are more susceptible in a population. They can be used to detect CWD through their submission of samples. And they can reach herds, quote unquote, reach herds, you know, deep into wilderness areas or, or, or deep into other herds that are harder for wildlife managers, managers to get to and provide some data. So in my mind, we really need the hunter as an ally in this battle against CWD. And we got to think very carefully about our testing protocols, our testing lag, as well as our other management actions and how it affects their behavior and expectations because we can't afford to lose them in this fight. Well, I think that's why we're here. In a lot of ways. I mean, Artemis and Outdoors, we represent lots of hunters, anglers and, and work for them and with them to try and, you know, tackle things like this. And so I appreciate you saying that. Let's talk a little bit about what you, you talked about briefly there, Matt, and that's transmission to people, because I think that's the worry, right? I mean, I, I think if no, if, if everybody thought there was no chance of it eventually transmitting to people, I think you'd take a big chunk of the hunting population and others that just, it would fall off their radar, right? They wouldn't care that much. So, yeah. you know, we've heard that it's jumped species barriers. It's done a lot of different things. Can you just kind of talk about where that lies, where we're at with that conversation? Yeah. Well, it, th this is one of the more thorny ones and, you know, a, a brief story. I, I got a, a series of panicked emails last year by a father just should win the father of, of the year award in my mind, who had harvested a deer, um, submitted sampling, didn't think much of it, submitted his head for sampling as he was required to by law, didn't think much of it, and then enjoyed the venison with his family. And he has two young kids. Um, a, a week later, he got his results back and it was positive. And the poor guy literally went into clinical panic attacks, concerned, oh my gosh, what have I done to my children? Um, and, and emailed me and it <laughs> emailed me many times. And it was like 2, 3 a.m. in the middle of the night when, when I got to my desk in the morning, I just had all these emails from this one person that had contacted me through the CWD Alliance website. And I thought, oh my gosh, what has happened? And it was really useful to me because it really humanized, again, this problem we're talking about and, and what that means for people, what it means for us. I'm a hunter as well. I have been my entire life, my family, all, uh, all of the protein my family consumes are pro is protein that we harvest. We buy some chicken every now and again, but it's not very often. And this has been a part of my heritage for a long time. And talking with him over email, and then he actually called me and, and hearing, to the, hearing his voice of a concerned father and going, I'm trying to get an answer. Can you just tell me, are my kids going to get sick? And I had to say, I'm sorry, as a scientist, I can't say 100% no. And he's like, well, what does that mean? What's the probability? And I said, dude, again, I've got to be a jerk here and say, we don't think it will. But again, unless we got 20 people and injected their brains with um, infected deer brain itself and then watched them for two years, I can't tell you for sure. So I want to first recognize the humanity of this problem and recognize how difficult it is to get our heads wrapped around this. So this is a, a, a this will drive our behavior. And in my mind, this is something our listeners, your listeners should really think about and, and understand as well. This problem and how we react to it as humans 
is probably the biggest challenge with CWD. So here's what I told him, and 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 hopefully this is useful to all your listeners, is that one of the with as weird as these transmissible spongiform encephalopathies are, these prion diseases with all these big fancy names, one weird characteristic about them is that they show this this thing called species barrier. So let's look at cows and deer, for instance. In the early days when CWD was found in those deer pens out in Colorado, one of the big questions was, oh my gosh, what happens when wild deer interact with livestock? Is this a problem? So basically what we did is we took 13 cows. Well, I didn't. This was even before my time in, in the field. They took 13 cows. They threw them in to the pens with these infected deer and then watched them for a decade or more. So they're interacting on a daily basis with infected animals. They're they're swapping saliva in the water trough, all the stuff that had always caused deer to be inf infected in that particular pen. And a decade later, not a single one of the cows had the disease. And there's examples like this all among the family of these prion diseases where there's a species barrier. To be honest, we as scientists, and I mean scientists like way above my level even, don't know why that is. It just is. And when it, when it comes to humans, although we haven't done that study I keep talking about where we actually infect humans, we do have some interesting data. We, we can look at areas like the Front Range of Colorado, for instance, and this work has been done, where you look at instances over the past 40 years of um, prion-like diseases that have occurred in the population that would have been documented in the hospital system. And we can say, okay, over the past 40 years, CWD has increased a lot in this particular area. And we know there's a lot of hunters in these towns. And we know that there's a lot of hunters who harvest locally and consume their meat. So if this was transmitting to humans, we should see some spikes or some increase in prion diseases in humans in those communities over the past half decade. And the answer is, it's actually decreased over time. So there's studies like this that we can look at and we can say, it really doesn't look like it's happening. We do, we have done lab studies th through mice and other things that have shown there does seem to be a robust species barrier. But to be honest, on the flip side, there's also been some laboratory studies that have shown if you take a CWD prion and you put it next to just human form prions and you basically vibrate the tar out of them in a chemical bath for a long enough time you can force some of those pre human prion normal proteins into that misformed type. So we, we know if we extract the proteins from the organisms and just throw them together, we can kind of force things to happen. That said, that doesn't mean that occurs in the complex system of nature. And that doesn't mean that occurs through the normal, what would be a transmission route, which would be a human consuming or orally ingesting the infectious prions. So, what I, I told all this to my friend as we were talking over the phone, and I said, what this means is that your kids have a vanishing, vanishingly, even impossibly low probability of this occurring in them based on the science that we have, number one. And number two, simply don't eat any more of the meat. And I encourage them as a policy um, measure, as the CDC also recommends this, if your animal comes back positive, don't consume it. I think that's helpful. Uh, I guess <laughs> we can talk about this too, but you know, maybe later we'll get to this, but the, uh, once you get it on your boots or your knife and how do you deal with that if it did come back positive and then, you know, it feels like it's something that's hanging around you now that you need to get rid of. But we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later, Matt, because we got some more stuff we, we want to talk to you about. Sure. First, I'll move over to, to population impacts, you know, a couple different things. It seems to, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's been hovering around in this, you know, some certain percentage of the population seems to have it. Maybe in places it gets higher, but overall it's, it's some certain percentage and you can help us with that percentage. And then another thing with population that I'd like to ask you is, it's more prevalent in, in, in mature bucks and bulls and, and talking about why that is true. Sure. Well, the, this is, again, you guys are answering all, or excuse me, asking all the right questions. So you've done your research. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to answer them. Um, you're right. If we, if you look at, let's say counties or game management units in the United States and Canada, 
and you ask yourself, of the infected cervids or populations in those areas, what is the rate of infection? We call that prevalence. Basically, prevalence is what percentage of that population is infected over the number of the total population. And you're correct in that if we looked at that on a very large scale, most prevalence levels are less than 5%, meaning less than 5% of the animals in that population are infected with the disease. However, there's a big however here. There are a lot of places, a lot of counties, a lot of units that have prevalence rates way higher than that. We're talking 20, 30, 40, in excess of 50%. And these are the areas we really watch to learn about. Um, There's a couple things that we've learned is that generally, if no management actions are done, prevalence rates will only increase over time. Sometimes it's slow. Sometimes it's more precipitous. The other thing we know is that in some places that have chosen not to manage the disease at all, um, some states that and areas within states where they've said, well, it's here, let's just let it do its thing. It has not plateaued in most cases. It continues to rise in excess of 50%. So that means more than one in every two deer are infected with the disease. So this is sobering to think about, but this is true. Just because prevalence rates are low on average does not mean that they will always remain so. And states that have, let's say, done aggressive management, then stepped away from it for 15 years, will often go back and find the prevalence rate starts to creep up again. So it's, we have to take it very seriously. And it, frankly, it just has to be managed. If you leave it alone, it's very unlikely. And frankly, we just haven't seen cases where if you leave it alone, the disease stabilizes into something healthy. It just continues to increase over time. So what, when, where does it start to get quote unquote untenable or dangerous? And this is an interesting conversation. There's two ways to answer this. One is you ask the question, when does the population really start to quote unquote suffer? You know, when are animals dying faster than they're being recruited? And the current studies that we have seem to indicate that between 20 and 25% prevalence, when the rate is that high, when about a quarter of the animals in a herd get infected, the herd's growth rate starts to go down and the, the herd health starts to go down. We also see changes in age structure. So let's remember, this is a long-lived disease, but it's not infinitely long. Um, it's long enough that a doe can actually be infected with it and still give birth to a fawn or two before she succumbs to it. But it means she's going to she's gonna die early. So we see the... the um, the age structure of the population get younger. We also see, this is the thing that has happened in Colorado, the old age class bucks just start to disappear. You just don't see five-year-old age, five and six-year-old age class bucks anymore. That as prevalence starts to go up, that starts to disappear. So these effects really start to kick in. So it, it, the disease can fundamentally change the way a population is structured. Um, so, Ideally, where should we try to manage the population? This is kind of the second way to think about this question. So the first was, how bad does it have to get (laughs) to where we really see some problems? Then the second question is, okay, if we know it's going to get bad enough that we got to address it, where's the best place to hold it? If eradication doesn't work, and thus far we've never been able to eradicate CWD outside of those cases of, of, of the Toronto Zoo and New York, we've never been able to do it. So if we can't, where should we keep the prevalence numbers? This, I will say, is kind of an open area of scientific debate within the management community right now, but I think some of the most compelling data has come out of Colorado. I want to give credit to Dr. Mike Miller and then Matt Eckert, who works for Colorado Parks and Wildlife and their CWD management plan. Um, It really looks like if you can keep prevalence below 5%, at or below 5% within a herd, that's manageable. Um, the, the, it means the spread of the disease is slow enough that you have time as a manager to implement things that can impact it. And it means that it's not so high that a bunch of hunters are going to get the disease and it will disincentivize them from hunting. So to me, that's where I think we need some more answers is where do we really need to try to hold it? And Colorado is taking the approach of let's have different severity of management actions based on different prevalence levels. When prevalence hits 5%, let's do some light things. If it hits 10%, well, we're going to need to do some more serious things. And if it gets over 10%, we're going to have to drop the hammer on it. Well, what about, let's talk a little bit about that bucks and bulls thing. 
Can you can you unpack that a little? Why it why it seems to be more prevalent in bucks and bulls than it is in in does, or at least more. I don't know. I, yeah. I don't want to say the wrong word here, but stronger or, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's it's a good question. Like so many answers about CWD, I have to start it with a caveat of, boy, I wish we knew more. But we do know some things. Um, we, we know that males are more mobile. They move around a lot due to dirt, the rut. Um, they come in contact with a lot of individuals. So their individual probability of getting infective is probably higher. So they're moving longer distances and they're coming in contact with more animals. Um, and that those behavior characteristics are probably the reason it's higher as opposed to some genetic predisposition because they're male. We, we, also, we know that um, as they get older, their probability of having the disease goes higher and mature bucks have a tendency to be twice as likely to have the disease as mature does. Although I will say um, some research out of Canada as well as Pennsylvania has shown that older does and family groups, um, uh, they, they can have prevalence rates almost as high. So it's not, I would say, 100% firm rule, but it's a pretty good guideline that you can expect um, mature older age class bucks to be twice as likely to have the disease. So what does that mean? Well, there, there's a couple really important implications of that. One is, you know, if, if more mature bucks, um, as nature intended, are breeding more does, it means you have an individual that's more likely to be infecting the disease in very close, or, or spreading the disease in very close physical contact with more individuals, as opposed to a young buck that probably is not gonna come in contact with as many individuals. The other thing, um, if we look at the human dimension side of this is pretty much every North American hunting tradition. And Ashley, this is something as your involvement with Artemis, I'm sure you think about as well is most Amer or, well, like, like I said, the, the American hunting tradition going as far back as there has been one has always focused on take out the mature or excuse me, um, do, do, do management to increase the quality and age class of the males. Unfortunately, that's exactly what CWD would want. We are incentivizing animals to get older that have a higher probability of having the disease, transmitting it, and shedding it on the landscape. So this, this unfortunate dynamic of the disease also really throws a wrench into some strong traditional feelings about how to manage huntable populations. And I can tell you, really becomes a problem when you look at industries like guiding and outfitting as well, and where the incentives the incentives are within those folks who are making a livelihood off of these public trust resources and the expectations of their clients. So Matt, we've talked about how it's pretty unlikely that humans can contract CWD, especially just through eating venison. Uh, we've talked about how there's, you know, some prevalence rates that are maybe okay for population management. Like you t mentioned the 5% threshold as something to think about there. Um, but one thing that I think, you know, and so to this point, hunters might be listening and thinking, well, it's not so bad. Like I'm probably not going to get it. It can be out there and if it's managed, it can be okay. Um, but I know, and I would like to hear you speak on, there's some research that, that's been done documenting population declines, I think both in mule deer and white-tailed deer. Um, and I know that these data were collected in places that had very high prevalence rates, well beyond 5%. Um, but I just think it's important for everyone out there to know that over time, if left unchecked, this disease can reduce deer numbers, if nothing else. Yeah, and I'm going to go a step further, and, and I'm going to frame it slightly different. In, in North America, let's remember, well, in North America, but specifically the United States, wildlife are a public trust resource. That's a really novel thing in the history of the world, honestly, where you and I, us three on this call, we all have an equal share and of ownership in the wildlife resources with everybody else that lives in this country. So we have the control. So hunters now, let's say, enjoy that public trust resource in a very specific, very unique, and, and, and to me, I think a very fundamentally human way. And so the, 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 the future of that is really up to them. 
when we think about CWD, here's what I'd say to them as public trust owners who are responsible for these resources. If you choose to take the stance that CWD is not a big deal, as you say, Ashley, well, I'm probably not going to get it. There's a low likelihood I will shoot something. So why do we worry about it? Well, here's what's going to happen, mainly because we have documented it happening. That research you mentioned, Ashley, happened in Wyoming, if, if you and I are, are thinking about the same studies. And yes, it was done in whitetails and mule deer. And I'll reiterate a stat I threw out earlier is that when CWD prevalence rates got above 20, 25%, a documented reduction in the herd began, meaning the herd got smaller every year. That herd also lost its mature bucks. That herd also became less healthy. That herd also became younger. Now we have documented an increase in prevalence in almost every state that has the disease, in almost every species. So the point to hunters is, if you choose to ignore it, what will happen is that the disease will increase to the point where the herd will start to lose its viability, where the herd structure will be changed fundamentally and permanently, and we will probably see the extinction of some herds in some areas over time. That's just exactly what the future looks like. And I think the the point I'm trying to make here is an empowering one of for hunters who really have a strong sense of ownership in that public tr trust resource because they not only see it, they not only think about it, it's not only in their freezer, it's not only a point of their family's life as they're consuming it. For them, I think, and, and, well, all of those things, plus the fact that they are the major management tool that we have to use, the ownership of what will happen really falls at their feet. And they have the choice to participate and believe what the science has said or not. It's their resource, but their behavior and ignorance toward it, like the rest of the public, is exactly what CWD would want. If this disease could speak, what it would say is, hey, just ignore me. Not a big deal. I'm just there in the background. Let me do my thing. That's one of the problems with a really slow moving disease. It needs apathy to do well. And that apathy that I often see in hunters, in many cases, I think is what's contributing to the disease continuing to spread. I think, yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I think we use the word apathy, but we also have to talk about how hard it is to stay focused on a disease that is so nebulous. Like we've talked about how you're really not going to see it on the landscape. Like you're not going to come across a blue deer and be like, wow, okay, that's a CWD positive deer. And, you know, so hunters aren't really coming into contact that visually with a sick deer. And then they've heard about it. They've been inundated with information. I've got a stat here that I found when I was doing a little bit of prep for this episode. This is from a paper that was published a long time ago in 2002. Um, but it says that in Wisconsin, major newspapers publish CWD stories at a rate of more than one a day for 10 months in 2002. Yep. Right around the time when it was discovered. So it's like, after a while, I think just to stay sane, people probably had to kind of put their heads in the sand. And I think that's why we're trying to do this series is to kind of circle up and say, okay, we know a lot more now. We have a responsibility as sportswomen and men that care about this resource. And here are the facts. That's kind of what we're getting at in this episode is like, here's ground zero. This is, you know, we all have this information and then we're going to talk about how we can move forward with it. Yeah, we even have a term for what you're talking about in uh, the quote unquote, the biz. We call it CWD fatigue. Um, you're right. The news cycle has been miserable for this uh, or about CWD, but I don't want to blame them too much. Uh, our news outlets and let's say legacy media are not used to covering something that has a, a significance of like more <laughs> of over five years. If we, if we look at CWD, um, you know, uh, if you really wanted to measure a population impact of a management strategy that you put in place, you wouldn't see it for like three to five years. That's how slow this disease is and how slow it is to detect, hey, did we do a good job or not? So you're right. From, from a hunter's perspective who's thinking year to year, just hearing these stories over and over and over again um, is exhausting. Plus the fact whenever it does pop up, it's always sensationalized. And I'll take some credit for the zombie deer disease thing. Um, 
I was giving an interview to a reporter that started that and we had a conversation and he heard everything that you all had heard. And he said, oh, this sounds like a zombie deer apocalypse. And I was like, dude, don't say that. He's like, but that's really what it is. I mean, the deer are listless and and staggering around. This will be fun. And, and I knew what was going to happen. And I implored him, please don't do this. Um, but it got put out there. And I think probably a lot of your listeners saw what happened. And it just went bananas. And then they hear people like me saying, hey, this has been around for a long time. It's not a big deal. Then they listen to the media and they go, but they're saying it's like zombies. What, what choice do you have except to just tune it out? So I hear you. I get it. This is what I would say um, to those folks that are that way. I would say, well, it is a long game. And, and what the, the ask of, of hunters isn't really that you pay attention every single year. That's really not what the ask is. I want you to do two things for the rest of your hunting career. That's it. Well, maybe that, that's not a simple thing because I'm saying forever. But here's the two things that I think you need to change. If you're hunting in an area um, where there's CWD, help support the management actions in that area. If they ask you to test, submit your heads for testing. If they're going to change harvest rates of buck to doe, modify your hunting behavior to help support that work. Just just help the agency. They have the research. They know what they're doing. The second thing is, if you're any other person that cares about wildlife, help support the legislature and the policy around managing the disease to give your state fish and wildlife agency authority to change, to make management changes, to support budget initiatives that you know help things like testing. You're going to have to make those changes long term. So if you want to get out of the news cycle and the panic button, that's fine. But those are two actions that I think hunters and wildlife enthusiasts are going to need to make long term. And that's my ask of them to help those trying to combat this disease, honestly, for probably the, you know, I mean, forever in servid management history in North America. Remember, you own this wildlife. The agency is just trying to manage your public trust resources, help them manage it, or else it is going to kind of get driven into the ground. Matt, that's a great segue to one of the things we would be remiss if we didn't talk about just a bit, and that's the politics. Mm. You know, the the what can we be doing legislatively, regulation, rule, you know, wildlife commissions, like what are the various factors that are playing into this that either prevent or promote, you know, good management on this. And I'll say it too, prefacing with, you know, we're going to get uh, Representative Ron Kind on from Wisconsin, who's introduced the CWD Management Act. Um, and, you know, it's through the House now. But talk about that broadly, if you will. You know, you've been in this yeah. game for, you know, 15 plus years. What have you seen with the politics and what helps and what hinders? Yeah. Well, yeah, obviously a lot, but let me talk about two levels. Um, one is support in the, for, in, in, in the form of funding or good policy or regulation. Um, the other is constituent groups. These would be the, the public trust owners. That's where the politics either can be the savior or the the devil in the management. So here, what we need, what, well, because of everything we've talked about, that CWD is really difficult biologically, that it takes a long, long time to manage well, that we're talking about managing at a population level, which means a lot of area. Um, and it requires a lot of person hours in the form of submitting heads, testing heads, getting results back. You put all that together, you know what that means? We need a lot of money because money buys time, person hours, and resources. And state fish and wildlife agencies can only do so much. Agencies at the state level are in an era of fiscal constraint right now because of, we, we, I don't need to go into this story too much, but the short version is we as a nation did a bad job at figuring out how to equitably pay for conservation so that everybody who everybody in the state who is an equal owner is paying their fair share for healthy populations. We did a terrible job of setting up that system. So it means 
the funding of all wildlife conservation is falling on a diminished and very small fraction of the total population, which means there's not much more blood to squeeze out of that stone. So agencies are, their hands are tied when CWD enters their state. They need to do a bunch of stuff, but they don't have the money to do it. So efforts like the kind bill, and many bills that preceded it trying to get some fiscal help from the federal government and sometimes other sources to help agencies with their management actions, their surveillance, their testing, that's critical. And it has to be ongoing. For In the early 2000s, there was about $18 million annually. It oscillated between 18 and $14 million annually that was available to state fish and wildlife agencies who are managing disease. That dried up mainly because of the longevity of this disease. Congress asked, you know, looked for accountability of the money and they said, hey, did you guys eradicate the disease? And agency said, well, no, that wasn't the goal. And Congress said, well, everything seems fine. So we're going to put this money elsewhere. It's really hard to convince politicians who have a very short tenure and incentive in their tenure to look two or three tenures beyond their own and say, You're, we need to set something in place that's going to span 20, 25, 30 years. So that's a real problem there. So we need continual efforts to secure those resources for agencies because of this fiscal um, dilemma that we're in. And I do want to give a shout out to groups like the National Wildlife Federation, um, Nas- uh, National Deer Alliance. Boone and Crockett Club, um, a lot of other NGOs, uh, Teddy Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, who are working hard on legislation like that perennially. You guys keep doing the good work because we need that. So that fiscal problem and the longevity, that's that's sort of one angle. The other angle that I mentioned is with the constituents themselves. This is where politics gets messy and uncomfortable. And I think it's a, a good lens to look at this is through, let's say, a war of three constituents. Your wildlife lovers slash yard slash backyard bird feeders, your guides and outfitters, and hunters. Each of these groups is sort of a tribe of wildlife enthusiasts who have taken ownership in their in in their public trust resources in a very active way. And CWD just throws a grenade in the middle of all their incentives. If you're a guide and outfitter and you've been invited to a CWD strategic plan writing process. And you hear the biologists say, hey, we need to knock down the mature bucks in this, let's say, um, high trophy unit because they're, they're probably spreading the disease and we need to take more of these big bucks up the landscape. What you're hearing is a reduction in your client bill in future years and threatening your livelihood. How are you supposed to react to that? When you go to backyard birders and say, you have deer coming to your bird feeder and eating the spilled feed, we have CWD in this area, and the saliva and the contaminated soil around your bird feeder is spreading this disease. We need you to stop feeding your birds. What is that person going to think? And and the 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 the, their daily lives and the the joy they take out of, of watching birds. Then you look at your hunters, which are kind of stuck in the middle of this. Like, I don't listen. I don't want to eat positive or CWD infected meat, but I want to have a tag every year. I want to keep um, giving my family, you know, clean, organic, sustainable protein. But I hear what the guide now fitters are saying. I hear what the agency is saying. I hear what these other folks are saying. I just, I don't want to lose. They have the sense of loss. I just don't want to lose out. And you're asking me to change fundamental traditions that me and my father and my mother and my aunts and my uncles that we've been doing for years and years. And you're saying all those traditions now are spreading this disease, you know, they're going to have a strong incentive to not believe it. So this, when you think about the politics of this and how, and how CWD affects it, what you realize is that a lot of the good things in the North American model of wildlife conservation, um, things like public trust doctrine, public trust ownership, management by science, CWD has absolutely fractured that model and poses a bunch of disincentives to what previously had been very good things that allowed it to function. Well, Matt, you're, you continue to peel back more layers of the onion here. Um, but that's what we Are wanted to do with this, so I'm glad. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I think they are. <laughs> I'm going to ask you one more thing, uh, and then we'll try to do a wrap-up of this, and we're going to ask you back perhaps at the end of this uh, series to 
to help us kind of unpack this and, and look to the future. But um, the last thing I would say is, is I think one thing people don't think about too with part of what you mentioned is the states manage the wildlife, yet to attack this, we need a national response and we need a, you know, we need money from Congress. We need resources that are beyond what an, a typical state might be able to achieve considering all the other things they need to balance in their budget. So the one thing that I think it'd be worth maybe touching on before we move on here is, is that, because I think a lot of people still sit out there and don't really get how the wildlife, uh, the federal state wildlife interplay happens. And can you talk a little bit about how that may, uh, you know, lend itself to even more difficulties with managing this? Sure. And in the spirit of, of science, I'm going to offer some critique to your statement, not criticism. Um, I, I don't think, well, I'll when you it. mentioned, okay, honest, uh, well, the, just we'll let your eyes wa water as I peel back one more layer of this onion just a little bit. When, when you were saying that this thing needs more than, well, it needs a state response and a federal, federal response. I would say that's not untrue, but I think we need to be clear on when we're thinking about effective management of CWD, and when I say effective, I mean we're actually reducing prevalence and we're stopping spread. When I think about that, the primary agent that is by far the most well-equipped to handle that is the State Fish and Wildlife Agency. Every state, every Canadian province has an agency who's charged to basically do two things. If you look at their mission, their mission charges them to do two things. One is conserve species and habitats, wild things and their wild places. And number two, do that for future generations. So it means you have to do that conservation in a sustainable way so that people can utilize and enjoy the resources that you're conserving. The federal government does not have a mission like that. The federal government does not have a charge there, does not have a jurisdiction to do that. That's, that's what the state's jurisdiction is. So if money is going to get tight between those two entities, it's the agency that even if money gets tight, they're still charged to do that. So they're most likely to have the most impact and effect. Plus, that agency understands the culture in their that agency understands the culture in their state. They understand their publics. They understand the dynamics of their species. They understand all of that. So my thinking is, and I'd, I'd be happy if if um, Senator Kind uh, disagrees and he'd love to hear his perspective on this, but my thinking is the best thing the federal can, government can do is to help let's say, smooth out the dips in the oscillating funding cycle that agencies go through and help agencies retain a sustainable management budget over time. Like, you know, over the time horizons we're talking about to manage effectively for CWD, um, that will most likely impact CWD in a way that is meaningful to creating herds that are healthy enough and that can live with the disease long term. So, just wanted to make that clear. And, and I think that's pertinent to this question of, of how the disease actually does get managed and how politics comes into play. So I'm a big believer in state fish and wildlife agencies doing this. I'm also a big believer in the need to partner with agencies. So let me build a little bit more on how agencies do their work. So remember, a state fish and wildlife agency, their job is to essentially be the managers of the public's trust. So I live in Colorado. The role of Colorado Parks and Wildlife is to manage my wildlife that I have ownership in because, frankly, I have other things to do. I have awesome podcasts to talk on. I have kids to go play with. And I have deer to go pursue with my rifle, muzzleloader, and bow. So the agency's job is to manage it for me. And according to the rules we've set up in this country, their job is to manage that following science. And their job is to work on that in a way that is most that will you know take care of my personal bias and and do it in a way that incorporates the use of everybody who has wildlife ownership. Well what that means is me and the birder groups and the mountain bikers and the guides and outfitters we all have to be deeply embedded with that agency to provide constructive feedback to them and assist in their delivery of their mission 
and here's the most important point, most important point, according to science. This, this, I cannot understate. <laughs> this is so important because for an agency to work well, politicians starting at the governor's office, all the way down to the field technician, they have to be committed to understanding that nature is neither friendly nor unkind. It's simply indifferent. Nature doesn't care how we feel about things. Nature doesn't care what our traditions are. Nature doesn't care how we make money. Nature simply operates by its own rules of indifference. We have to, an agency works well when everybody contributing also understands that and recognizes there's going to be times when nature's indifference will really tick you off and will be a real bummer in the way you would prefer to enjoy your public resources. But frankly, if you don't recognize nature's autonomy, you're going to lose out. And where I'll, where I'll end this is that where I have seen most CWD management, um, well, where I've seen most state fish and wildlife agencies become crippled in their ability to manage is because we as the public trust owners and the politicians that we support fail to recognize that our own desires are being used by CWD in a very indifferent way to destroy the resources we hold dear. The solution is if we all recognize that our own perspectives have the pro have some probability of damaging our resources, if we all acknowledge that and we go into a meeting and we participate and support politically according to that thinking, then I think agencies can really do their job. If we don't do that, if we stay tribal, if we, if we say, hey, me as a guide and outfitter, I'm more important than you birders. Me, me as a hunter, I'm more important than you day hikers. If we keep doing that, that's exactly what CWD needs to impact populations in a significantly negative way well into the future. That was beautiful, Matt. I, I think if, if more people could just abide by that, I think we'd be a lot further along. And I hope we can help people get to that place with this podcast and you know, Ashley and I prepared a lot of things we wanted to talk to you about, and, and we're at the end of those at this point uh, for today. Uh, but I do want to give you the opportunity to say anything else, uh, even though you did just amazingly sum it all up right there. But before we let you go, you get one last chance. <laughs> awesome. Well, you, you you should learn to never give me that platform because uh, I am Irish and I'll say I have the gift of the gab, most consider it a curse. Um, so I'm, I'll take advantage of it here. Bottom line with all this is the bottom line why I got into natural resource science is because m my role, and I think an extension to all of us, our role in nature is a really unique one in the history of nature. Um, being a part of natural systems is very much a human thing. I believe we have forgotten some of that. And CWD, as well as many other issues, often show that our reticence and ignorance of that can have profound impacts on the world around us. So to those listening, what I would simply say is, you don't have to fix everything. Shoot, you don't even have to fix most things. But remember that you own this wildlife and what happens to it is on you. And to the degree that you can help, please do. If it's as simple as just shutting up and allowing a state fish and wildlife agency to alter some of your hunting traditions, do it. If it means you need to stop some backyard feeding, just do it. If it means you need to support a, just simply support a ballot initiative to help your agency get some more funds to manage it, please do it. Because future generations um, will look back, your kids, your grandkids, and whatever you do now is going to be on them. So Keep that in mind. And if there's any way that myself, the CWD Alliance, um, and I'll extend it to the organizations that both of you work for, if there's anything anything we can do to help to um, get you to understand that more, please let us know. That's why we're here. Beautiful. And I'll let Ashley uh, summarize what, what she's thinking too, and, and I will real quick, and then we will we'll let you go, Matt, and we'll plot on into the future of this series. Ashley. Matt, you have the gift of the gab. You've demonstrated that here. You summed all of this up beautifully. I don't know that I have a lot to add, but I think that um, just in talking about 
how states can manage this disease and how hunters can help them do that to me. And maybe I'll think differently at the end of this series, but to me, that is the ultimate thing. The ultimate interaction that is going to help us get a handle on this is having cooperation and a high level of trust between state wildlife agencies and um, hunters. Because a lot of times I know agencies may have the, the desire and potentially even the funding to do what they want to do and do what's best as far as uh, mitigating the impacts of CWD, but it can be a struggle if they don't have hunter support. And so trying to, I don't know, trying to get hunters to understand the right thing to do and then to feel like it's something they want to do um, is what I hope we can do here. Also wise words and I'll, I won't say anything uh, too redundant here because I think we get that point, but mine is one that I continue to say in other places, but it's, it, it's applicable for all wildlife management. And it's just that with the big, huge privilege of being able to have these awesome critters and, and the habitat that they live in and the ability to pursue them comes an obligation. And we hope that, uh, this podcast series can incite that obligation and get people more engaged. And that's really the point. And we appreciate Matt's commitment to, to exploring this issue with us and the work he does. And we'll wrap up episode number one of the CWD Chronicles with Matt Dumphy from the Wildlife Management Institute and the CWD Alliance. And, and thank you to Ashley. And look out for episode number two, folks. Thanks for coming, Matt. Glad to be here. Let's do it again sometime. The Chronic Wasting Disease Chronicles. A production of NWF Outdoors and Artemis.